Uh, welcome to our webinar today, Managing Patient Safety Across the Sedation Continuum. I am very, very excited to be joined today um, by uh, Dr. Mike Ramsey, uh, Kevin, McQueen, uh, Kevin McQueen, and by uh, Marty Moore. So um, just a, a few uh, housekeeping items, and then we're going to ask everybody to, to introduce themselves. Um, it, we do have credit available for this activity for nurses, pharmacists, and physicians. Um, CE is only available to those who attend the live webinar today. So if you are viewing this uh, on video after uh, today, December 22nd, then I'm sorry, uh, we are unable to provide CE for that. Um, if you are going to get a CE, then you can anticipate receiving a, an email from MedStar, who's our CE provider with an evaluation tool. Uh, you, it may take up to a week to receive that email from MedStar. Um, if you uh, complete that evaluation, then you will receive your credit. And none of our planning committee members and none of the speakers today have any financial relationships to report. Okay, so I would love for our panelists to go ahead and introduce yourselves. Let's start with Kevin. Good morning. Hi, I'm Kevin McQueen. I'm the system director of respiratory care for the University of Colorado UC Health System. Uh, we encompass 12 hospitals along the Front Range in beautiful Colorado. Um, I am a former uh, risk manager and patient safety officer from Northern San Diego County, and I currently serve as the president of the Colorado Society of Respiratory Care. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kevin. Marty. Good morning, my name is Marty Moore and I have been a chief nursing officer with, uh, for over 20 years, um, leading at a system level and then uh, magnet and facility levels. Currently right now, I'm a healthcare consultant and I consult on patient safety. And then additionally, um, I have been doing strategy work for COVID prevention and containment on the senior living side, working across the nation. Uh, so it's been a little busy these days, um, and I'm so excited to be here and for you to join us. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Marty. And Mike Ramsey, thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Thank you, Donna, for the invitation. I'm Mike Ramsey. I'm Chair of Anesthesia at uh, Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, part of the uh, Baylor Scott and White healthcare system that consists of about 60 hospitals across the state of Texas. Um, I'm also past president of the Baylor Research Institute and uh, past president of the International Liver Transplant Society. So a lot of different hats I've worn in the past. Um, now I'm concentrating on anesthesia and sedation, which has been uh, part of my career, whole career really is uh, safety and sedation. Wonderful. Well, then you are the right person to get us started with this. Um, you know, I know that there are, you know, maybe some folks in our audience who aren't familiar with the term, the sedation continuum. Can you talk a bit about, you know, what, what that means and, um, you know, when did this become an ASA focus? Okay, well, it became an ASA focus in 1999. But when I think about sedation continuum, I could give you two, million, two milligrams of Versed, um, which is a anxiolytic drug, uh, and to you, it would probably do just that, just make you a little more calm and uh, not uh, do much else. But I could give it to somebody um, in poorer condition, a more frail, elderly patient, and that two milligrams could stop them breathing. And so we've got two ends of the scale, and this is the continuum. And so virtually every sedation drug, there are a few exceptions, uh, and opioid drugs, uh, will do this. So uh, depending on what level of sedation you want, uh, the, the American Society of Anesthesiologists came up with guidelines to help keep patients safe as they receive these drugs. And you go from this, where you would go with this two milligrams of uh, Versed from minimal sedation, just angiolysis, but you could go right to the right side of that screen uh, if you're frailer and more elderly and end up in general anesthesia, not breathing, and very quickly become unsafe and need resuscitation. 
And so that's why this continuum has been put together because the drugs have different effects and also the recipients of the drugs also have different effects depending on these drugs. So we want people who are gonna give these drugs to know what to do if the patient moves on to the next level in this continuum of sedation. In other words, they go from angiolysis to moderate sedation, can you take care of them? And do you know what to do? Do you know how to monitor them? And uh, if they go on to deep sedation, can you take care of them? Do you know how to make sure they're breathing adequately? Are you using the correct monitors? And this is the continuum. And it's trying to bring that home to everybody who administers these drugs, that they have the wherewithal, the knowledge, the technology to keep you as a patient safe, uh, depending on what level they're targeting and make sure they can take care of you if they overshoot and you go to the next level. So that's kind of an overview of what this continuum is. Sorry, Sorry Mike. Uh, now I can go on. This, this was to talk about uh, one of the later questions, Donna, that you're going to give me. This, this, that first one yeah. was just the continuum. But when people overshoot, you end up with the recalling of a rapid response team in a hospital. And uh, I'll talk about that on one of your later questions. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mike. Marty, um, you know, very often it's the nurses who are administering and um, these these uh, all of these uh, sedatives and and also monitoring them. What are the nursing considerations that administrators need to be aware of? I think you know one of the things that we have to do is is we've got to move nursing out of kind of that tactic mentality. So I give a medication, I go on and I do something and really have to look at and think about how sedation is, is done through, you know, the full continuum, um, as Dr. Ramsey was talking about. And what I've watched and what I've seen is, and, you know, my, in my uh, earlier career, I was a, a pediatric flight nurse, and so we would do rapid intubation, and, and we would deliberately go to uh, general anesthesia to, you know, to make sure that we were um, running the airway and the breathing what people don't think about is, is really and truly that kind of, you know, sliding scale thought process around what am I administering? What's the impact within, you know, the body and how it's going to be metabolized? And then additionally, understand the medications that we're giving. Understand how long they stay in the body. Don't assume that they're short window periods because many of these medications are not. And then additionally, what are the uh, safeguards? What are the safety nets that we put in place? And you know, I think, I think we kind of have a tendency to put uh, safeguards in place for what we assume is uh, moderate sedation. But many times on general floors, medical surgical floors, we're giving medications that easily could flip somebody in as Dr. Ramsey was talking about. Do you have the safeguards, the protocols, and the monitoring in place to ensure that safety is number one? Don't look at these medications as run-of-the-mill, over-the-counter medications. And I do think we've normalized them. And by normalizing them, we don't understand the safety risk to them. So you've got to in incorporate that. You've got to elevate knowledge transfer. So it's not just watching kind of an LMS moment and thinking nurses understand uh, sedation, understand the drugs that they're giving or the medications they're giving. It has to be kind of a perpetual feeding in and elevation of learning so that you can create that safety net. So what organizational gaps are you seeing in your role as a consultant these days? Uh, a lot, actually. And what I'm seeing is, is in, 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 in many places, you know, the things that I, I kind of touched upon is, is that um, giving medication is seen more as an action, it's a tactic, um, and that we're not necessarily stepping back and putting all the puzzles and pieces together. I've seen policies that are still reflective of the work that we had done around sedation, where if you're giving a certain kind and um, you're, you're utilizing uh, oximeters, you're utilizing monitoring, what we're not understanding is, is, is simple pain medication can create, just as Dr. Ramsey talked about, can create actually um, a level of sedation that we don't want. 
Um, and so you're seeing these events. And, and what's really fascinating is, is that in some areas or within some departments of hospitals, um, they've done a good job, but they don't talk to the other uh, parts of the hospital. And so you have practice and policy in one place that's not reflective in other places. And so it has to be standardized. You cannot have as much variation as we do. And on the outpatient side, that is one, actually one of the highest risk areas. And so you've got to engage in a conversation around how do we create safety? How do we put safety nets in place? Um, and it's just, you know, I, I kind of call it the, the Rocky Mountains because in some places there's great practice. And then in other areas, uh, you see kind of uh, practice that is not at the same standard. Yeah. Well, thanks, Marty. Uh, Kevin, um, I wonder if you could, you know, talk to us from the respiratory therapy perspective. What role does a respiratory therapist play in, in sedation? And, you know, what's that structure there in terms of their, their reporting structure? So, um, like Marty had said, outside of the operating room, nurses primarily do the majority of uh, providing sedation effect medications and pain management meds like opioids. Um, but respiratory therapists, our training is very specialized and extensive when it comes to ventilation and oxygenation of patients. So I just believe that hospitals really have to tap into the respiratory therapy leaders and bring it together so the nurses and therapists work together along with the providers to provide the safest environment for the patient. Um, so not only looking at how are we delivering the meds, but how are we assessing the patients, how often we're assessing them, and how we're monitoring them. Um, because I believe that if, if organizations, like Marty had said, if they're not doing everything they can to protect that patient, they are putting care providers, especially nurses on acute care floors, at tremendous risk of having to deal with an adverse event because a patient has a horrible outcome. Um, that could have been avoided just by better design processes. Um, many states, the respiratory therapists, they're degreed and licensed similar to the nurses, um, but depending on the scope of practice for that state, um, I've worked in states where the respiratory therapist can provide the uh, opioids and the sedation medications directly, as like if they're in a bronchoscopy procedure. Um, other states require that a registered nurse has to give that, but the respiratory therapist can be there assisting and helping to better monitor the patients. We are also seeing a great shift in our profession where some states are starting to approve advanced practice respiratory therapist degree uh, and licensure, uh, which is very similar to a nurse practitioner. So moving forward in the next coming years, I believe respiratory therapists, especially at the advanced practice level, will be able to work very closely with anesthesiologists, nurses, uh, creating much better processes to keep our patients safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about the role anesthesia plays. I mean, obviously, we know the role that anesthesia plays in general anesthesia in the operating room, but across the entire sedation continuum, um, you know, what, what, uh, what organizational protocols do anesthesia oversee? Well, first of all, just let me echo and really support what Kevin's just said. The respiratory therapists are the front line of our hospital now. They're out there rescuing patients when people overshoot on this continuum of sedation. It's the respiratory therapists that are keeping us out of trouble and keeping uh, the patients in good shape. They're, they're really our front line and we've got to thank them very much for the job they do. Um, I can hear, I'm surprised it hasn't gone off already, an RRT call uh, on the overhead speaker in my office here, but um, uh, they really are the lifeblood of the hospital at the moment. Um, so, well, well said, Mike, well said. So in terms of the role of anesthesia, we're charged by uh, CMS and the Joint Commission to uh, put together policies, uh, policies on sedation. And we've had moderate sedation policies, we've had deep sedation policies, now we have procedural sedation policies, these are policies where we aim to keep the patient safe, number one. Number two, to make sure the proper monitoring, the proper drugs are being utilized, and the proper safeguards are there. And um, for different levels of training, people can get credentialed to provide moderate sedation. If you want deep sedation, you've got to be able to take care of that next level, which was in that first uh, slide that I showed, which is general anesthesia. 
So that means you've got to be able to know how to breathe for somebody, how to resuscitate somebody, how to support their hemodynamics. So that does require quite intensive training to be able to do that. Uh, moderate sedation uh, by itself, if you didn't overshoot, is something where you've really got to be able to maintain an airway because that's going to be the first thing that the patient loses. Uh, as they get more deeply sedated, particularly those with sleep apnea, they will obstruct. If you're not monitoring, if you can't detect that, that patient can get into trouble. And so you've got to have the basic training of airway management, hemodynamic management, and what to do when you overshoot, because everybody's response to the drugs is varied, depending on their structure, their genetics, et cetera. Uh, anxiolysis is something that um, is on the very light end where you're just giving a small amount, usually an oral drug, to take the edge of somebody who's uptight. And that should not get somebody into trouble. But occasionally, as I said to begin with, somebody can be very sensitive to some of these drugs where somebody else is very resistant to them. So you have to know how to take care of that next level of sedation. And so we put these policies in place. They're approved by the medical staff of the hospital. Uh, and we put through testing um, to make sure those credentials are understood and uh, that the person is competent to be able to manage the different levels of sedation of the level that they're applying for the credential for. And we also oversee it. And if they're over sedation events, they come straight to my desk here to review, to look at and see what happened, uh, why did that patient become, get into trouble, and thank goodness for the RRTs that are sitting there, Kevin, uh, who running the corridors all the time to make sure these patients are kept safe. So thank you. Yeah. Well, and you know that uh, I see that um, there was a question that Marty had for the group um, regarding monitoring, and and Mikey answered much of that question, and looks like Kevin is has uh, also answered a lot of that question. Obviously, we always think about um, monitoring patients with you know cardiopulmonary uh, you know uh, uh, monitoring while we're doing deep sedation or moderate sedation, but we don't always necessarily think about appropriate monitoring when the patient has some kind of oral sedative. So Kevin, can you talk about that? Talk about, you know, the, the, you know, the other end of the, the continuum and, and, and how opioids are associated with um, respiratory depression. So as we all know, you know, opioids are pretty much the mainstay of pain management. Um, and there's a lot of benefit on that, but it's also a very, there's a lot of limiting factors we have to, as clinicians, think about when we're giving these meds. And often I feel really bad because we hand these meds over to nurses that may have four or five, six patients on a long drawn out hallway. Um, and that puts, there's a lot of risk. So when we think about it, these opioids, you know, they inhibit neurons in the brainstem and that can significantly reduce the patient's respiratory ventilatory drive. It can reduce the um, tidal volumes, their minute ventilation. And some people, I always say there's a fine line. We're trying to either manage pain, um, especially with um, all of our CMS requirements where we really are scored on how well we manage pain. But at that same time, there's a fine line between you push it too far. You're trying to manage pain and patients sometimes have unrealistic expectations that they'll be pain-free. But when we're trying to give pain-free medicine, there's a risk that you will put them over the edge to where you're going to knock out enough of their respiratory drive that they're gonna go into opioid-induced respiratory depression. Um, there are many risks that when we see patients, they come with you know a whole list of comorbidities when they get admitted. Um, and nurses have to deal with many, and there are probably, there's seven primary risks that we talk about. Um, unexplained or unexpected uncontrolled pain is one of the big ones, anxiety or agitation. Um, altered airway condition um, or issues that say the patient has obstructive sleep apnea, they have unusual anatomy in their airway, or they were a previous history of difficult airway uh, intubations. Um, increased sedation. One of my biggest preaching moments is always we have to monitor patients postoperatively, at least for the first 24 hours, if they're receiving um, what an organization determines to be a significant amount of opioids. 
whether that be with a PCA pump or IV push or even uh, patches or oral, um, these all, depending on, like Dr. Ramsey said, depending on the patient, can have much greater effect than others. Uh, decreased ventilation is one of them. When we have uh, morbidly obese patients or they've had abdominal or chest wall surgery where they're not taking deep breaths, uh, patients with impaired gas exchange, this could be your chronic lung patients, uh, people that are smokers, poor cardiac function, um, some elderly people or people that have kidney dysfunction so they can't metabolize the meds as well. Or my, as a, being a patient safety and risk manager, one of the biggest ones hospitals sometimes overlook is the ability to do patient surveillance well, depending on the nursing units. Um, in the ICU or the step-down units, you have a pretty close nurse to patient ratio and you have a lot of direct line of sight. When you get to the acute care settings where patients are down long hallways and may great, there may be great distance from the nurse's station, we don't have direct line of sight and we don't have the ability to monitor the patients as well. And that's why we need to have good solid electronic monitoring devices um, that are designed to alert the care providers um, when there's something going wrong. So that's one of the biggest areas I think I always tell people, you really have to design and assess your organization's ability to properly monitor patients. I know that when I was doing a lot of research with the Hospital Quality Institute in California, I, I spoke to Dr. Frank Overdyke and he gave me a great piece of information. No matter how many times we assess patients for high risk, there will always be patients that he's reviewing on his desk that didn't have any risk factors at all. That's why when I answered the question in the panel here, I said, you have to, I, I just strongly feel we have to monitor everyone that's receiving these opioids postoperatively because you have, you have the sedation effect from a general anesthesia on top of the opioids, and that can be a major problem. And so, so Kevin, I wonder, you know, what do you think the barrier is there? Why do you think that clinicians and administrators and hospitals don't recognize that everybody needs to be monitored and how incredibly dangerous it can be? Um, well, back in 2017, while I was working with HQI, at that time we found out that about 50% of the hospitals across the United States do not have very detailed programs surrounding sedation and pain management that includes electronic monitoring. Um, the monitoring can be quite costly, but a single serious event can be much more costly to an organization, not only financially, but reputation. And throughout my career of working in this, this is one of my areas of tremendous passion. I've met parents that have lost their children or spouses that have lost their husbands or wives due to this exact thing. And it could have been avoided by simply monitoring the patients. Um, just like Marty said, one of the things I talk to nurses when I've done risk reviews is um, I go to talk to the nurse and they say, well, I gave the medication because the doctor ordered it. And because the doctor ordered it, I felt it was safe. Well, it's a potpourri of medications they order. And it's huge and it's click boxes nowadays with EMRs. <clears throat> and I always tell the nurses, you really have to critically think what are you giving? Because if you're giving concomitant meds and you're giving opioids for pain, you're giving muscle relaxants because they just had neck surgery and they don't want them to spasm. Um, they're giving them anti-nausea meds, they're giving antihistamines. Every one of these compound each other and give a greater sedation effect and can put that patient over the edge. So. And where a nurse may actually think, oh, the patient is finally calming down, they're resting, they may be going to sleep and going into deep sedation and potentially going to have a significant adverse event. And without a monitor, you may not realize that until it's too late and you can't call a rapid response and you can't bring them back. So that's why I preach over and over again, you need to monitor uh, these patients. Mm -hmm. Yes, great, great. Well, Mike, you've had a lot of, uh, of experience there. I know you've got some, some other slides to show us. Let me see. Donna, while you're pulling up your screens, there was a question about the role of pharmacists. And yeah. uh, I, I actually uh, have implemented and utilized and recommend that pharmacists need to be such a key part in figuring out the individual um, kind of regime that you should utilize what, and exactly what was Kevin was talking about. And we have a tendency not to rely upon 
our pharmacists, um, and they're such a part of our teams in their knowledge and understanding of not only these medications uh, and how these medications interact, but, but additionally, the individual patient and the ability for the patient to clear it. Um, if there's renal issues, um, just all the kind of uh, presentation of this patient, uh, the pharmacist can guide and assist in understanding dosaging and what kinds of medications should be used. We don't do that because we're always so busy and Kevin Herrick described it beautifully. We use our checkbox and we implement our orders without thinking about really and truthfully, this is a high risk medication. These are high risk medications. What safeguards do we need to do? Um, and mm -hmm. your pharmacist is a key part of that. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, and you know, uh, you know, multidisciplinary teams we're finding, you know, obviously are, are the, where we really need to go. We need to, you know, make sure that, um, you know, that we get out of our silos and we'll function together. So Mike, tell us about, uh, you know, how you reduced rapid response calls with your team. Sure, and absolutely, I want to echo it. It is teamwork. Everybody's involved here in patient safety. So how do we reduce rapid response calls? And many years back, we had 41 calls on one floor which in a month, which was our trauma orthopedic floor, where people have long bone fractures, rib fractures, a lot of uh, analgesia, particularly opioid analgesia was used. So if you give me the next slide, uh, please, uh, Donna. And uh, this is Frank Overdyke, who Kevin mentioned. He and I have worked a lot on this problem of over sedation. And uh, I just want to emphasize a few of the things that Frank has published. And that number one is there's an estimated 5,000 deaths a year in the United States from prescribed opioids in hospital. These are medications that we physicians have prescribed, given to patients to help them, and we've killed them. That is totally unacceptable. That is something that we have to stop. We can stop. We will stop. Uh, and and uh, we need to use medications that are safe in the right doses for our patients. And we absolutely have to monitor patients to avoid respiratory depression, a side effect of these opioid drugs. So next uh, slide, please. So when we had these 40... Uh, to calls in one month, we decided we needed to sit down and really look at what was happening. So we put together a group that we called the Breathe Team, because breathing is good. Uh, we had respiratory therapists, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, hospital administrators, patient safety officers, and even patient advocates to come together and sit down and brainstorm every one of those calls as to why that patient got over sedated and needed to be helped out. Next slide. And we felt we knew who the high risk patients were. We felt these were gonna be the sleep apnea patients, the morbidly obese patients, uh, those receiving a lot of uh, opioids. But in fact, when we went through every single patient, the bottom line was it can happen to anybody absolutely the fittest, healthiest patient can get into trouble uh, with the amount of opioid that might be perfectly fine for somebody else. Everybody's metabolism is a little different. Everybody is special. And we need to have that in front of us when we're prescribing opioids and we're monitoring the effects of these opioids. Uh, next slide. And so these were some of the things that we noticed right away. One was that our orthopedic surgeons and trauma surgeons had um, uh, multiple post-op pain order sets. So we honed it down to one that everybody agreed on, just one set the nurses had to handle. So there was not multiple order sets, which most of them were actually with escalating opioid uh, amounts because the physician didn't want to get called for a pain management in the middle of the night. And so we stopped that. Two, we stopped continuous opioid infusions into opioid naive patients. In other words, if this patient wasn't a chronic pain patient who we knew how they were going to respond to opioids, we would not allow a continuous PCA pump. We stopped that. We also instituted an oxygen withdrawal trial. Now, what is that? 
Well, one of our respiratory therapists mentioned that many of these calls for RRT, rapid, rapid response teams, occurred within about 30 minutes of the patients leaving recovery room and arriving on the floor. And she said, I noticed that they all had nasal oxygen on them. Well, we kind of thought, well, oxygen's good. Oxygen's the green gas. It's, it's good for everybody. Why would she be questioning the oxygen? But we sat down with the recovery nurses and asked them, why are all these patients on oxygen when they leave recovery? And then we found the real reason. It wasn't that it had been ordered to go back to the floor. It was because there was pressure on turnover in recovery. They wanted to move the patients out so that more patients could come in. And the patients were not meeting the discharge criteria as far as oxygen saturation went. Whereas if they put them on nasal oxygen, they met the criteria. So we questioned why did they not meet the criteria? These are patients with normal lungs, no lung disease, no impediment to their breathing, and yet they weren't making the right level of oxygen saturation. And the answer was because they, were, had, they had respiratory depression from the post-op drugs they were getting in recovery on top of the anesthetic drugs that had been given during the surgery. So we then decided the quickest way to be able to diagnose this without doing blood tests is take the oxygen off in recovery room, make sure those patients can go 15 minutes without oxygen and not desat. And that was probably the biggest thing we did that had a positive effect because as soon as we did that, now if the surgeon wanted oxygen on the floor, that was fine, but they went through this withdrawal trial, which was just a poor man's trial of doing this, just looking at the oximeter. And if they maintained their saturation, they did not have significant respiratory depression. And that made a big difference. The other thing we did was we put continuous electronic monitoring, as we've heard uh, people talk about uh, so far. And when you think about, you get in your car, if you were going to back into a brick wall, the car will alarm and tell you stop. If you move out of your lane, the car will shudder. It will let you know you're drifting out of your lane. The monitoring technology has advanced tremendously. And so now we have monitors that can keep patients safe and can alert the caregivers to go check on the patient if they are getting respiratory depression or are uh, getting overdose from the pain meds that have been given. Next slide. And so we did that and we also put in processes to avoid opioids. You know, morphine is good, but there are other drugs you can do and use and techniques to avoid giving patients opioids. And around the same time, enhanced recovery techniques came in place where the idea was to try and get patients out of the hospital within 24 hours if you could and avoid the side effects of opioids. And uh, so we got back into using regional anesthesia. We got back into using low-dose ketamine and we'll use low-dose ketamine on the floor, on the ward uh, at low doses, not so that the patient will get into any problems. Uh, we use drugs like dexmedetomidine that really don't affect your breathing and uh, help with analgesia. So we moved to these non-opioid techniques uh, and again, reduced the drugs that were causing the problem very significantly. And believe it or not, not only did we avoid these rapid response team calls, the patients did better. They improved faster. They got out of bed faster. They got home faster. And so we put continuous monitoring in, avoided opioids as far as possible, and the patients did better. Next uh, slide, please. And uh, what do we monitor, particularly oxygenation, because pulse oximeters now are available very readily. Uh, everybody understands pulse oximeters. And uh, where we're having to use significant opioids, we'll put respiratory rate monitoring, continuous respiratory rate monitoring by a monitor or end tidal CO2 monitoring. And uh, we reduce the alarm threshold so that uh, the nurses don't get alarm fatigue, but all this put in place has reduced our RRT calls on this trauma orthopedic floor to two or three early calls a month instead of the 40 that we had. And uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock, uh, 
have put this in place in their uh, post-op uh, floors and uh, they have not had a more opioid induced mortality in something like 10 years since they've done this. So this, and they've also saved the cost because these patients have not had to go to ICU. They can be looked after on the floor. They're not getting the RRT calls. So the mechanism to stop all this is there. We just have to have the will to put it in place because our patients will do better. So thank you, Donna. I did not unmute myself. Thank you, Mike. That is, that, that is uh, you know, it would be so wonderful if everybody could adopt those, those uh, monitoring standards. You know, uh, um, I, I know that, um, you know, M Marty, a lot of hospitals have not adopted those standards. What are the barriers there? Why, why are, is it so difficult to get hospitals to adopt that? Yeah, there's challenges to it. And, and one of the things is it's just resources, you know. So uh, um, one, of the, one of my actions as a, a chief nursing officer is, is I wanted to do universal monitoring. So you develop wireless capabilities so that any place, any time a patient could be monitored. And then you had it uh, being built into your alarm systems. And, and so either your nurse call systems or your pager systems, whichever you had. In doing so, you know, it was multi-million dollars um, that this initiative was. Uh, and I was going up against, uh, you know, things for the OR and uh, facility building uh, repairs and a, a new roof, you know. <laughs> and so you get this tension um, and you have to think about it, not from the standpoint of either or. It's like, okay, how is it that we know that there's resources uh, associated with facilities and all the things that have to happen, there's resources that are absolutely um, associated with uh, continued growth and in different kinds of services. But, uh, but leaders have to say, and then there's resources that are always committed to advancing safety. That's the conversation I think that you have to have. It isn't that it's an afterthought and it isn't that it's this kind of thing that happens. It is truly that strategically we believe in safety and we're going to allocate the resources to that, that it's always part of us advancing our patient safety um, um, programs and our commitment to it. And when teams see, when employees see the fact that you are continuously giving um, allocation of resources to that, your culture of safety starts to also do this. It is a direct correlation um, from it. So that's the conversation that leaders have to have. It, is, it, it can't be that this is a, a, a wish. It can't be that it's a nicety. It is not that. It is not that. It is truly an allocation that has to be there. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike, you know, you know, one of the things that um, we want all organizations to do is, is to build in some, um, some clear tools and, and, uh, and ways to measure the things that they're monitoring. Tell us a little bit about the Ramsey sedation scale that you, that you developed 45 years ago. Why, why did you uh, develop that and what's been the outcome of organizations adopting it? Okay, well, let me just follow up a little bit on Marty though. Next slide that you have there, please, Donna. If you can bring it up. Give me one it? sec, Mike. Sure. And Mike, while uh, Donna's bringing up the slides, there's uh, several questions about medications that I'm thinking you're actually more inclined to answer. Um, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, I can give you my background on ketamine, but it's been a bit since I've administrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Mike, that was really interesting information that you shared before about the ketamine. I, I uh, and somebody had actually asked that question right before you reviewed it, so. And I apologize, I don't know why it, it just keeps going out as soon as I stop sharing my screen. So I have to start over for some reason. So I apologize for that. Slides. Okay, this will be the last few slides once we get there. So just go back to that one. Just go back one, would you? Uh, because if we have adequate monitoring, failure to rescue should be a never event in the hospital. We ought to know somebody's getting into trouble before the event occurs. 
if we had monitoring, you know, everybody's got personal monitors. It could be your watch, it could be your Fitbit, it could be whatever. Um, and and uh, it will start to tell you when your pulse rate is changing. It'll start to tell you if you're getting hypoxia. It'll start to tell you if you're getting an arrhythmia. The technology's out there. So we should be able to go, the nurse should be stimulated to go see the patient, alerted to see the patient because they're getting into trouble so that we're not going into rescue, we're going in to intervene in what's occurring. Uh, and next slide. Donna, thank you. And I just want to, just to really bring it home, I, because I talk about this quite a lot, I get emails and, and messages and phone calls from family members who have had a disaster with a family member. This was from a nurse in Ohio who sent me this, and her 40-year-old husband had gone into hospital to have a single-level laminectomy. He went through the surgery in one hour, successful. He was one hour in recovery, no problems. He then went to the floor where he was put on a PCA hydromorphone in PCA pump. And he was not checked on until nearly two hours later when the team came in to check on him, he was dead. They coded him for three hours trying to resuscitate him. Absolute disaster, they weren't able to. And of course the wife is very distraught about this. What can she do to prevent this happening to anybody else? And the sort of lame answer that I could say is, you know, if you'd taken him home from recovery, he'd be alive today. He did not need to stay in the hospital, but that's because that hospital wasn't safe. Our hospitals have to be safe. Our hospitals, if you're gonna deliver an IV continuous infusion of opioid, that patient must be monitored. And that patient was not monitored. And uh, one of the early monitors that we put in place is that everywhere, you know, the Joint Commission mandated oh, 20 years ago that we had to have a pain scale and that we had to monitor pain in all our patients. Well, we put a sedation scale with the pain scale as a second monitor because level of sedation drops as you, retain, as you retain carbon dioxide, you become sedated. And so we put the Ramsey sedation scale next to the pain scale as a safety measure to be sure that the patients weren't getting over sedated. So next slide. And this was the scale, incredibly simple, uh, but then simple things get picked up on and um, people will use them. And uh, as I say, I came up with that 40 years ago uh, and it was for the ICU. Uh, and uh, next slide, just go rapidly through the next few. Uh, it got picked up by, I think I have it in 20 different languages, again, because it's simple. And next slide. And then in uh, 2010, 11, I joined a clinical practice guideline task force for critical care medicine and um, came up with a new scale to um, really improve the management of patients in our ICUs. Next slide. Because what we wanted was a, an ICU where the reason I came up with the scale was back in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, even up to 2000, if you walked into an ICU, and I used to run an ICU in London, every patient on mechanical ventilation was in a coma. And it was nearly always a drug-induced uh, coma, not a traumatic coma. These patients had been put into coma because people were frightened of them pulling out an endotracheal tube of dislodging an IV. Uh, and the only way you, when you walked around the ICU making rounds, you knew the patient was alive, was by looking at the monitors because you could see the heartbeat up there. But there was no interaction with the patient. And when we got a success back in the 70s and a patient would get over um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, and there weren't many that did get over it in those days, but when we did, uh, we'd say, wean them off the ventilator. Well, it would take weeks to get them awake and get them off the ventilator. It would take weeks to get out of the ICU. They'd spend weeks in the hospital. Then they'd go to rehab. And then when I called the family a year later, uh, you'd hear, usually it was the wife who would answer the phone. I'd say, how's Mr. So-and-so doing? Oh, he's doing fine. I said, 
Is he back to work? Oh, no, no, no. But he's sitting in the chair looking at the television. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. Uh, and then suddenly I realized the wording looking at the television. I said, what is he watching? Oh, he's no idea, would say the wife. He's just looking at the television. And then I realized our success was a complete disaster. The family had to look after this invalid husband. He never got back to anything functional. He never got back to work. Where did we go wrong? And certainly there are many things that put that patient into a coma in the ICU. Sepsis, hypoxia, hypotension, uh, et cetera. But also the management of drugs was not controlled. And part of this was drug induced. So I came up with that sedation scale with the idea that instead of prescribing drugs in milligrams per kilogram, that we would prescribe them to a sedation level. And uh, that's what we did. Uh, it finally got picked up on with a drug called dexmedetomidine and then propofol. Uh, and and um, the patients in ICUs now could be up and active and you could even be walking the floors in the ICU on mechanical ventilation. So this whole concept of the animated ICU came through from the Society of Critical Care Medicine around 2010, and patients have done so much better. And uh, so that's where that came from. And um, I, I'm just so delighted that so many years later, it really now, what I was thinking back 40 years ago, has finally come to fruition. And you can walk into an ICU now and patients are cognitively interacting with you, even though they've got an endotracheal tube down, even though they may be on ECMO. If it's upper limb ECMO, they can walk. Uh, and, and the ICU is a very different place. It's much more vibrant than it was, and the patients are doing better. Thank you so much, Mike. You are absolutely right. Um, it, it, you know, getting our folks up and moving and, you know, being as normal as possible is so, is so absolutely critical. Um, you know, as Marty mentioned before, there were a few other questions regarding medications. Um, someone had asked about Lyrica and Tramadol, drugs like that. You know, your thoughts on, on, on you know, monitoring and sedation issues there? Okay. Um, I think drugs like gabapentin have a place. Um, uh, acetaminophen. Uh, the Australians and Europeans have used acetaminophen for years when we've been using opioids. Now suddenly we've started using it in significant doses here in the US, patients are doing better, less opioids. Uh, I think you have to be a little careful of some of the um, pro-drugs that are out there. Drugs like codeine. Codeine is a pro-drug for morphine. And there's a few people uh, who are rapid metabolizers of codeine. If, you, if you've got the enzymes or the genetic makeup to rapidly metabolize codeine, you'll produce high doses of morphine. And there's been a number of deaths associated with that, particularly in children. Um, equally, you may be a slow metabolizer and the drug doesn't work. It's not that the child or the adult are malingerer, it just didn't convert to morphine. And so there's a genetic side to some of these all drugs, particularly the pro-drugs that go to the opioids that uh, probably uh, we ought to be getting some genetic testing done uh, if we could bring it down to a reasonable cost so that we know what's going to happen to that drug when we prescribe it. So, so much better if we can do better without the opioids. I think they've had their place. There still is a place for them, but um, a much more controlled environment. And if we can manage to go without them with drugs like acetaminophen, non-steroidals, uh, without the side effects of those drugs like bleeding, et cetera, um, then uh, I think patients will do better. Great, thank you. There was also a question about ketamine. I thought that, I, I apologize, I thought earlier that they were asking for, you know, when you spoke of the low dose ketamine, but um, it looks like that the person was specifically looking for information about pre-hospital administration of ketamine, I know, or, you know, in the emergency department, the use of ketamine. Any, any ideas on, uh, on the safety of the, those practices? Yes, we, as long as you've got a protocol in place. We, I'm not sure about out of hospital use of ketamine because it's an abuse drug, unfortunately. Um, and uh, that would have to be controlled. But we certainly our emergency room does use ketamine. We use ketamine in low doses on the floor. We've got a protocol in place and where those 
big long bone fractures are, many of those patients are on a continuous infusion of ketamine. It's not stopping them breathing. It's reducing the amount of pain medication, opioid type medications that they need. They're doing better. And the low dose, they don't get any dysphoria with it. Um, uh, it, it seems to, it has a place. There's no doubt about it. It has a good place. Um, so I think there are many alternatives to the opioids that we've, that we've got. I, I just see one of these messages now coming through from Ed Salazar at RRT. I've met him, God bless him. Um, he, he's a, a, a real tribute to the profession. Uh, unfortunately, he lost his son um, from an airway problem in a hospital. And he's part of a team um, uh, really trying to make our hospitals safer. So um, uh, uh, God bless you, Ed, and it is great to see you listening into this program. And we should have invited you on. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Ed, for your comment. And, you know, our, our thoughts and prayers go out to you. Um, I wonder, uh, Kevin, there's a couple of questions I wonder if you can help us address. Um, someone was talking about or asking about monitoring specifically in the PACU. Any thoughts on the use of CPAP in the PACU or the measuring of minute ventilation to avoid safety issues in the PACU? All right, so one thing I want to talk about is the fact uh, Dr. Ramsey talked about withdrawing oxygen in the PACU there in Texas. Being that I'm up here in Colorado, we're 6,000 to 8,000 feet in our hospitals. So we tend to have to use a lot of oxygen. And so this is something that we really try to get out to the nursing staff and other clinicians is if the patient is receiving supplemental oxygen, their hemoglobin will most likely be very well saturated. So even if they go into respiratory failure or even worse, respiratory arrest, it may take minutes before the pulse oximeter catches it. So that's why we, that's a late indicator. So a lot of the talking that we say around here is don't rely on pulse oximeter alone. It's a great device. And in majority of cases, it will catch it. But we use capnography um, because it's breath by breath. We can see if the patient is starting not to ventilate well. Uh, respiratory rate is a huge one. It's the most common trigger that we see on our monitors up here at altitude. Uh, the minute ventilation monitor that the gentleman did discuss here is I've tested that device multiple times. It does a great job. Um, I like the fact that it has uh, electrodes on the chest and not on the patient's face because some patients push back. They don't want additional monitoring um, things on their face. Um, it really has to come down to the organization. I tell everybody, you need to assess the devices and figure out what works for your patient population. Um, I am very comfortable with capnography. I'm comfortable with the minute ventilation monitoring. Um, but every organization, they really have to, you have to do an assessment very thoroughly of your organization. Where are you using or, uh, opioids? Um, have you looked at your closed case reviews for adverse events? Um, are you pulling reports on unplanned use of reversal agents like Narcan? Uh, are you drilling deep down into your rapid response calls to say which ones are related to over sedation or decreased respiratory rate situations? you have to look at where these problems are occurring. So where are you using opioids? Where are you using PCAs? Are you using IV push? So organizations, I always say, you really want to take the time to analyze where your risk occurs. And like Dr. Ramsey said, if you push away from using PCA pumps, great, you've eliminated one risk. But I tell people never rest in your laurels. Go on, what is your next level of risk? So keep that assessment going and dollars are limited. So I tell hospitals, go after your biggest risk events first. Let's say you go after and monitor all post-operative patients that are on PCAs or get certain levels of IV push. Great, there's your start. And expand it as you can over time to allow you to have more and more monitoring to keep patients safe. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Marty, I wonder if you can answer a question, if, you know, it, or address the issue of you know human factors and biases in the issues that we have with sedation. Well, you know we've kind of danced around it uh, this morning and talking a little bit about uh, you know kind of what's called human error factor. And what a, a beautiful example was uh, the the need set was to move uh, the PACU to turn over the PACU, and so nurses knew that there was criteria. Um, so they added the oxygen in uh, to get to meet the criteria. 
and then the, you know, the patients then um, are transferred out and you have adverse effects. So when you think about human error factor and you think about kind of biases, and, and I touched on it earlier, human error factor is, is when we look at and think about what, what potentially could cause an error um, and, and with that, um, how is it that uh, we can put safeguards? So the classic examples were uh, the PCA pumps that we put safeguards in and we put checks and balances of having two people kind of double check your dosaging. That, that's, that's pretty classic human error factor. But here's where um, I want people to stop and think a, a bit about this. We have a tendency to look at um, IV push medication as easy to do. We do it all the time. How many times have you looked at your adverse events? How many times have you pulled through um, the fact that maybe there was a uh, miscalculation or overdosaging? And was there a double check? Do you have double checks that are in place? Now, most hospitals say we don't have time to do that. You don't have time not to do those kinds of things. Because I can look at something, think that I'm seeing what I'm seeing, and pull up the dosaging and tell myself again, it's bias, it's confirmation bias that what I've drawn is what I see. And then I can, med I can give a medication error uh, or a dosage in this two times more. And so it's those kinds of things. And we've worked forever. And I'm going to tell you, I haven't cracked the nut yet around how to keep medication administration sacred. It needs to be in a quiet place. I'm not being interrupted. We've normalized it. And that's a bias. That's a bias um, that has absolutely contributed not only to harm and hurt, but death. Um, and we know that. And yet we still are unable to change that framework because we carry these kind of visions of, of, of how we should be performing, how we should be administering medication, all those kinds of things. And from that, we then contribute to the safety issues that we're seeing. Now, the second part of that is the fact that I don't believe, and I can tell you in all the work that I've seen in my years of experience, I don't believe that we truly understand these drugs, um, that we do the in-depth education and, and transfer of knowledge around what these medications mean to the people who's administering it. And that's nurses. And so, you know, we will do a quick uh, pain management uh, kinds of education but it takes years of really thinking and understanding. And so you've got to build that into your advanced learning objectives that you are perpetually moving the dial forward so that people understand how these medications perform, drug-drug interactions, and, and then bringing in the knowledge experts, the pharmacists to do that kind of transferring of knowledge perpetually. That takes resources, that takes commitment. But again, if you are looking at your culture of safety, you gotta build that in. Absolutely. Well, we've only got uh, one minute left. Uh, Kevin, I know you wanted to talk about the HQI toolkit before we close. All right, since it's really quick, in 2017, late 2017, I had the great opportunity to work with a large group of nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists, uh, patient safety and risk management managers, and of course, pharmacists at the Hospital Quality Institute in California. And we published this toolkit that helps organizations from literally the very beginning all the way through your entire process between orderables, monitoring what devices should be used, patient education, everything. It's a step-by-step, -step, easy to use, no cost toolkit. If you just Google HQI, uh, respiratory depression, you'll see the toolkit, you can print out the PDF. It is just very simple to help you achieve what you need. Thank you, Kevin. And we will be sure actually to link in the description on this video and we will send to everybody on this call the, um, the PowerPoint slides that we saw today as well as the HQI link and a link to the um, ASA standards for moderate sedation. So Thank you so very much, everybody. We are at time. I wish that we could continue. Um, I, I, I apologize that we weren't able to bring the patient and family voice in to this webinar. You know, we re usually try to do that, and we thought that we had a panelist who, who um, fulfilled that role, and I'm so sorry that, that, that the, um, we weren't able to make it happen this time. But moving forward, we, uh, we will do everything we can to make sure that we also have the patient and family voice in our 
webinars. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, Mike, and Marty. Always a pleasure having you on our webinars. Thank you. Thank Donna. you all. Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a wonderful day. Have a safe holiday season. Indeed. Yes, you too. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you so much.